Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Mike Kaczynski, Project Manager with FDA, and I will be today's meeting facilitator. This is a live public meeting that is being broadcast in its entirety through C-SPAN, YourCast, Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitter. Today's event is also being recorded and will be posted on FDA's FDA Advisory Perfect Committee Web page. I'm Along Mike with Kaczynski, all relevant meeting Roger, manager with FDA, throughout today's meeting, I will be and reminding I will be our presenters, committee members, sponsors, this is and a live speakers public meeting as to when they are being broadcast there a lot of in time its entirety and assisting them when needed. C-SPAN, just a reminder to everyone Facebook that once called upon to please YouTube manage your and mute Twitter. and activate today's your event is also being At recorded this time, and then will be posted on FDA's uh, to Dr. Arnold Monto, the acting chair, who will now provide opening remarks. Dr. Monto, take it away. I'd like to add my welcome to this 162nd meeting of the Vaccines and Related <laughs> Biologicals Advisory Committee of the FDA. We have one task ahead of us today, and that is to discuss and vote on the emergency use authorization of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for the prevention of COVID-19 in individuals 16 years of age and older. Uh, to kick the meeting off, uh, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Atreya uh, to go through the roll call, introduction of committee, and administrative statements. As we go around the committee, I'd like uh, the members to just introduce themselves and their affiliations. So Dr. Atreya, please. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Prabha Atreya, and it is my great pleasure to serve as the designated federal officer as our DFO for today's 162nd Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, and the WERPAC Committee. I would like to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Um, Dr. Manto already mentioned the topic for today. Our meeting is emergency use authorization of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for the prevention of COVID-19 in individuals uh, 16 years of age and older. Today's meeting and the topic was uh, announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on November 27, 2020. Now I would like to uh, introduce my excellent staff and also to make a few administrative remarks. Ms. Kathleen Hayes is my co-designated federal officer providing support today in all aspects of conducting this meeting. Other staff, Ms. Monique Hill, Dr. Janet Devine, and Ms. Christine Wirt also provided excellent administrative support. Please uh, direct any press or media related questions for today's meeting to FTA's Office of the Media Affairs at FTAOMS at FTA.hhs.gov. The transcriptionist for today's meeting is Ms. Allison Dean. We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call uh, for committee members and temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn your video camera, then state your first name and last name and your organization. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please uh, see the number roster slide in which we will begin with the chair. Dr. Manto, can we start with you, please? Thank you. All right, I'm Arnold Manto. I'm professor of epidemiology in the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Great. Dr. Amanda Cohn? Dr. Cohn, can you unmute your phone? We couldn't hear you, Dr. Cohn. She'll be on shortly. She's reconnected. So uh, let's. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Dr. Chatterjee. Good morning. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I'm the Dean of the Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Roger and Franklin University of Medicine and Science. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist by background and um, 
have an interest in. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Cody Meissner. Dr. Meissner. Thank you. I'm Cody Meissner. I'm a professor of pediatrics in the infectious disease division at Tufts University School of Medicine and Tufts uh, Children's Hospital in Boston. Great. Uh, Dr. Gann. Good morning. This is Dr. Haley Gann. I'm um, a professor of pediatrics at um, the uh, Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kurila, Mike Kurila. Good morning. Uh, Michael Carilla, I'm the director of uh, the Division of Clinical Innovation at uh, uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science within uh, the National Institute of Health. I'm a pathologist by training, and uh, uh, most of my professional career has been involved in infectious disease uh, drug and vaccine development. Great. Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, I'm Paul Offit. I am a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Anunziato, Paula Anunziato. Good morning. I'm Paula Anunziato. I, am a, I lead clinical uh, global development for vaccines at Merck, and I'm here today as the non-voting industry representative. Excellent. Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sheldon Tobman. Mr. Tobman? Okay, uh, Dr. Steve Fargum. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Sheldon Taubman. I'm an attorney. I represent low income clients mostly in the health area. Um, I'm employed by New Haven Legal Assistance Association, although I'm here today in my personal capacity as a consumer representative. Great. Uh, Dr. Steve Fergan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Pergam. Um, I'm an associate professor at uh, University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and um, I focus on infectious diseases. Mike, can we go to the next slide, please? Great, Dr. Dr. Fuller, Ovita Fuller. I'm Ovita Fuller. Good morning. I'm Ovita Fuller. I'm an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Michigan Medical School and a member of the African Studies Center in the International Institute, and I'm a virologist by training. Great. Uh, Dr. Kim, Captain Kim. Good morning, David Kim. I'm the director of the Division of Vaccines uh, at the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy under the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Great. Dr. Eric Rubin. Hi, I'm Eric Rubin. I'm Editor-in-Chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, a professor at the Harvard School, uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and an infectious disease clinician at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Excellent. Uh, Dr. James Hildreth. Good morning. I'm James Hildreth. I'm the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College, a professor of internal medicine, I'm a viral immunologist by training. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Janet Lee. Good morning. Uh, I'm Janet Lee. I'm professor of biostatistics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Great. Next slide, please. Dr. Juan Banaklok.
Good morning. I'm uh, Juan G. Abanacloche. I'm an infectious diseases clinician at the um, Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. Great. Uh, Dr. Mark Sawyer. Good morning. I'm Mark Sawyer. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego, and radiation in San Diego, and I'm a an pediatric infectious disease specialist. Excellent. Dr. Melinda Watson. Good morning. I'm Melinda Borden. I'm an adult infectious disease physician by training, and I'm director of the Immunization Services Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Great. Thank you. Dr. Ofer Levy. Good morning. Um, my name is Ofer Levy. I'm the director of the Precision Vaccines Program at Boston Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Great. Uh, Dr. Pamela McInnes. Uh, I'm Pamela McInnes, retired deputy director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the National Institutes of Health. Good morning. Great. Uh, Dr. Patrick Moore. Good morning. Uh, I'm Patrick Moore. I'm at the uh, University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute and the Department of uh, Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. Great. Uh, Dr. Ralph Tripp. Good morning. I'm Ralph Tripp from the University of Georgia. I'm a chair of vaccine therapeutics there. Okay. Dr. Sandy Perlman. We can't hear you, Dr. Perlman. Mike, can you adjust the volume? Yes. I Good morning. I am Dr. Stanley Perlman from the University of Iowa in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and in Pediatric Infectious Diseases, and I'm a long-term coronavirologist. Great. I think uh, Dr. Amanda Cohn is uh, available. Can she introduce herself just for a second? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm Captain Amanda Cohn, a Chief Medical Officer of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, um, and a pediatrician by training with expertise in vaccines and pediatrics. Thank you so much. Okay, let's uh, now uh, do the introductions of the FDA staff. First, I would like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Peter Moss, uh, the head of the uh, Center for Biologics. Uh, Dr. Moss? Hi. So uh, thanks very much. It's Peter Marks, Director of Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And I just want to take a moment uh, to thank all of the committee members, as well as everybody who's uh, tuning in right now who might not usually uh, be viewing our usually sedate uh, vaccines and uh, related biologic products advisory committee meeting. Thanks very much. Excellent. Let's move on to Dr. Marianne Gruber, uh, Director of the Office of the Vaccines at CBER. Yeah, good morning. My name is Marion Gruber, and I'm the Director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review in the Center for Biologics and Research um, at FDA. And on behalf of my colleagues in the Office of Vaccines, I also would like to welcome the committee members, Pfizer-BioNTech, as well as the public to today's meeting. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the members of this committee to take, for taking time out of their busy schedule to provide their perspectives, their recommendations, and advice regarding the adequacy of the scientific evidence that will be presented by Pfizer and the FDA today to support a determination whether the benefits of Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine outweigh its risks to support authorization of this product under an EOA. FDA very much appreciates the committee's input on this very important topic, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gruber. Um, now I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Celia Witten, Deputy Director of CBOR, and also Dr. Philip Krauss, Deputy Director of Office of Vaccines, 
who may join later uh, making remarks. So I will now proceed with the conflict of interest statement. Okay, so the Food and Drug Administration is convening virtually today, December 10th, 2020, the 162nd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. Dr. Arnold Manto is serving as the acting voting chair for this meeting. Uh, today on December 10th, uh, 2020, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the emergency use authorization, EUA, of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for the prevention of COVID-19 in individuals 16 years of age and older. The topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties. With the exception of industry representative members, all standing and temporary voting members of the VETFAC are appointed special government employees are regular government employees from other agencies and are subjected to federal conflicts of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 United States Code Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members uh, regular government employees and special government employee consultants of this committee have been thoroughly screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own as well as those imputed to them including those of their spouse or minor children and for the purpose of 18 U.S. Code 208 their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements or CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FTA has determined that all members of this advisory committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized the FTA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial concepts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs the potential for a concept of interest created by the financial interest involved or when the interest of the regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services with which the government may expect from the employee. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members today. They are Dr. Ovita Fuller, Dr. Awan Panaklok, Dr. James Hildreth, Captain David Kim, Janet Lee, Dr. Ofer Levy, Dr. Pamela McInnes, Patrick Moore, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Eric Robin, Rubin, Mark Foyer, and Ralph Strip and Melinda Wharton. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there has been only one conflict of interest waiver issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. Among these consultants, Dr. James Hildreth, a special government employee, has been issued a waiver for his participation in today's meeting. The waiver was already posted on FDA website for public disclosure. Dr. Paula Anunziato is currently serving as the industry representative to this committee. Dr. Anunziato is employed by Merck. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representative on this committee is not screened for their financial interest. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industries and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Mr. Sheldon Taubman is serving as the consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared to prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. Today's meeting has multiple external speakers. We have three speakers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These are Dr. Nancy Masonia, Dr. Aaron Hall, Dr. Anita Patel. Regular government employees have all been screened for conflicts of interest and have been cleared to participate as speakers for today's meeting. 
The guest speaker for this meeting is Dr. Stephen Goodman, a professor of medicine and associate dean for clinical and translational research at Stanford University. He has been asked to disclose any financial interest he may have related to the product before the meeting. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for guest speakers follows all applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that they may have with any affected firm, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members today that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement, and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the transcripts of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to our chair, Dr. Manto. Thank you very much. Dr. Manto? Thank you, Prabha. Uh, here I am. Technical issues. Uh, which are going to be one of our biggest uh, problems I predict during the day. Uh, thank you for getting the meeting kicked off. Uh, I'd like first, and we're actually running a little early, to call on uh, Dr. Duran Singh of the FDA to talk about the uh, situation that we are facing and the presentation of a description of the emergency use authorization. Dr. Fink. Good morning. I'm Doran Fink. I'm the Deputy Director for Clinical Review in the Division of Vaccines and Related Products Applications within the Office of Vaccines Research and Review, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at FDA. The VRPAC last convened on October 22nd of this year to discuss the development, licensure, and emergency use authorization of COVID-19 preventive vaccines. Since that meeting, COVID cases and associated hospitalizations and deaths have increased substantially in the U.S. and worldwide. On November 20th, Pfizer submitted an emergency use authorization request for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, otherwise known as BNT162B2. This is an mRNA and lipid nanoparticle vaccine administered as a two-dose regimen 21 days apart. We'll be hearing more about the vaccine and its proposed use in later presentations. The use being requested for emergency authorization is for active immunization to prevent COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 in individuals 16 years of age and older. The information submitted with the request includes safety and efficacy data from a large, randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled phase three trial. And these data will be discussed in detail in our afternoon sessions. Today, we will be considering whether to make available to millions of Americans an as yet investigational vaccine that has been developed, tested, and reviewed in record time, with additional testing still underway in ongoing studies. The American public demands and deserves a rigorous, comprehensive, and independent review of the data. And that's what FDA physicians and scientists, all of us career public health servants, have been doing over days, nights, weekends, and yes, over the Thanksgiving holiday. This is in addition to months of re review work already completed on information previously submitted in preparation for an EUA request. FDA has been conducting its comprehensive review of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine EUA submission since its submission on November 20th. Our review has included verification of clinical data integrity of Pfizer analyses 
and also our own independent analyses using data sets that were provided in the submission. We have continued an ongoing review of chemistry, manufacturing, and control information, non-clinical data, and review of clinical assays, including information that was submitted shortly prior to the EUA request. We have been reviewing and revising, along with Pfizer, prescribing information and fact sheets for vaccine recipients and healthcare providers. These will be necessary to inform and instruct vaccine recipients and healthcare providers during use of the vaccine under EUA. And these materials are necessarily informed by our review of the data. We have sent and received back answers to multiple information requests addressed to Pfizer to clarify questions related to the data. And last but certainly not least, we have been preparing for today's VRPAC meeting. Today's meeting in which the committee will advise FDA with its own independent assessment of the data continues FDA's commitment to an expedited review process that is transparent, scientifically sound, and data-driven. The legal authority for emergency use authorization was established in Section 564 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This legal authority allows for FDA authorization of unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of approved medical products to address public health emergencies related to biological, chemical, radiological, or nuclear agents. Issuance of an emergency use authorization requires prior determination of a threat and declaration of circumstances justifying the need for an EUA to address that threat by the Secretary of Homeland Security, Defense, or Health and Human Services. To that end, Health and Human Services Secretary Azar issued a declaration on March 27th of this year justifying emergency use authorization of drugs and biological products to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Once that declaration has been issued, there are four criteria that must be met in order to issue an EUA. First of all, the agent referred to in the EUA declaration can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. We know this to be true for SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID-19. The second and third criteria are closely linked. There must be a reason to believe that the medical product may be effective to prevent, diagnose, or treat the serious or life-threatening condition caused by the agent, and the known and potential benefits of the product should outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. There are special considerations for a COVID-19 vaccine anticipated for widespread deployment to millions of individuals, and these will be discussed on my next slides. The final criterion is that there should be no adequate, approved, and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. At this time, the only FDA-approved product for COVID-19 is remdesivir. This is an antiviral agent that is approved for treatment of COVID-19, not prevention. Additional products have been issued under emergency use authorization, but have not been FDA approved. And none of these products is authorized for use to prevent COVID-19. Thus, at this time, there is no adequate approved and available alternative to a COVID-19 vaccine for preventing COVID-19 caused by SARS coronavirus 2. In October of this year, FDA released guidance outlining our expectations for submissions requesting emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines. And these expectations were discussed at the VRPAC meeting in October. There are three main areas covered by our expectations. First, data to demonstrate manufacturing quality and consistency. FDA has reviewed the manufacturing quality and consistency data for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine 
and found it adequate to support emergency use authorization of the vaccine. This will not be discussed in detail further at this meeting. Second, we expect clear and compelling safety and efficacy data to support a favorable benefit risk of the vaccine when rapidly deployed for administration to millions of individuals, including healthy people. And finally, we expect plans for further evaluation of the vaccine safety and effectiveness, including in ongoing clinical trials, active and passive safety monitoring during their use under EUA, as well as observational studies. In terms of clinical data expected to support an EUA submission for a COVID-19 vaccine, we expect a high bar for efficacy. Efficacy data from at least one well-designed phase three trial to demonstrate protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection or disease with a point estimate of at least 50% compared to a placebo. Additionally, the appropriately alpha adjusted confidence interval lower bound around that point estimate should be greater than 30%. This is to ensure that a widely deployed COVID-19 vaccine will have an appreciable impact. In terms of safety data, we expect these data from throughout clinical development to evaluate reactogenicity, serious adverse events, and adverse events of special interest. And we expect that a high proportion of phase three study subjects will have been followed for at least one month after completion of the full vaccination regimen. We have an additional expectation for follow-up that I will explain on my next slide. We also expect to be able to review sufficient cases of severe COVID-19 that have occurred in clinical trial participants to assess for signals of enhanced disease and also, if possible, to assess for preliminary evidence of protection against severe disease. We recognize that a planned case-driven interim efficacy analysis and associated safety analyses at the same time could provide data to support an emergency use authorization. We have explained that we expect these analyses to include a median follow-up duration of at least two months after completion of the full vaccination regimen. The reasons for this expectation are that, first of all, it allows time for potential immune-mediated adverse events to be evaluated understanding that uncommon but clinically significant immune-mediated adverse events to preventive vaccines generally have onset within the first six weeks following vaccination. A median follow-up of two months also ensures that vaccine efficacy is assessed during the time when adaptive and or memory immune responses rather than innate responses are mediating protection. And finally, this follow-up period allows for early assessment of waning protection and for assessment of signals of enhanced disease. Following issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine, we understand and expect that further vaccine evaluation would be needed for ongoing benefit risk assessment to support continuation of the EUA. But equally important, further vaccine evaluation would be needed to accrue additional data to support licensure of the vaccine as soon as possible and or to inform labeling. This further vaccine evaluation following issuance of an EUA would include longer term follow-up for safety, including in larger numbers of vaccine recipients and in populations with lower representation than in clinical trials. Further evaluation would also allow for more precise estimation of vaccine effectiveness in specific populations and more robust assessment of effectiveness against specific aspects of SARS coronavirus 2 infection or disease, for example, asymptomatic infection. This further evaluation would also characterize the duration of protection, could investigate immune biomarkers that might predict protection, and of course would be ongoing monitoring for signals of enhanced disease. 
issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine would be contingent upon the ability to conduct further vaccine evaluation, which would occur through a combination of active follow-up of vaccine recipients under the EUA, passive monitoring for clinically significant adverse reactions using established reporting mechanisms, for example, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, observational studies, including those that leverage healthcare claims databases, and finally, continuation of blinded, placebo-controlled follow-up in ongoing clinical trials for as long as is feasible, and strategies to handle loss of follow-up in those trials. We acknowledge that placebo-controlled, blinded follow-up cannot continue indefinitely as more information about a vaccine's safety and effectiveness becomes available. However, FDA does not consider issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine to necessitate immediate unblinding of ongoing clinical trials or offering vaccine to all placebo recipients. Of course, trial participants may choose to withdraw from follow-up for any reason, including to receive vaccine made available under EUA. And it may be possible to offer vaccine to placebo recipients in clinical trials in a reasonable time frame that doesn't compromise the integrity of the clinical trial. And these considerations will be discussed further this morning. When an EUA is issued for a COVID-19 vaccine, it will specify conditions of use for which benefit risk has been determined to be favorable based on review of the totality of available data, including those populations to be included or excluded from the EUA, conditions for vaccine distribution and administration, and requirements for safety monitoring and reporting of adverse events. Vaccine made available under an EUA will also include provision of information to vaccine recipients and healthcare providers via prescribing information and fact sheets. These materials will describe that the product remains investigational, will inform about the known and potential benefits and risks, and will also make clear what are the available alternatives and the option to refuse vaccination. Once issued, an EUA may be revised or revoked for a number of reasons. First of all, if circumstances justifying the EUA no longer exist. Second, if criteria for issuance are no longer met. And third, for any other circumstances that arise that warrant changes necessary to protect public health or safety. These other circumstances may be based on new information concerning vaccine safety or effectiveness, vaccine manufacturing or quality, or COVID-19 epidemiology or pathogenesis. The agenda for today's VRPAC meeting will include following the conclusion of my talk. First, three presentations from the CDC, providing an update on COVID-19 epidemiology, plans for vaccine safety and effectiveness monitoring under an EUA, and operational distribution plans for the vaccine under an EUA. We will then hear about considerations for placebo-controlled trial design if an unlicensed vaccine becomes available. Following lunch, we will have an open public hearing, and then we'll dive into a discussion of the data, first with a presentation by Pfizer, and then an FDA presentation. At the end of the day, we will have a committee discussion and a vote. We have two questions that we would like the committee to consider for discussion. These will not be voting questions. First, Pfizer has proposed a plan for continuation of blinded, placebo-controlled follow-up in ongoing trials if the vaccine were made available under EUA. We would like the committee to discuss Pfizer's plan, including 
how loss of blinded placebo-controlled follow-up in ongoing trials should be addressed. Second, we would like the committee to discuss any gaps in plans described today and in the briefing documents for further evaluation of vaccine safety and effectiveness in populations who received the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine under an EUA. Following discussion of these items, we will have a single question for the committee to vote on. The question is based on the totality of scientific evidence available. Do the benefits of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine outweigh its risks for use in individuals 16 years of age and older? This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fink, uh, for a very clear presentation. Uh, we have uh, a fair amount of time before the next uh, scheduled presentation, which is very good because I think uh, there are some questions of clarification that the committee may have about our guidelines for discussion and for our eventual vote. So uh, committee members, uh, please raise your hands uh, if you would like to ask Dr. Fink uh, some specific questions. We don't want to start our discussion of uh, the points raised by Dr. Fink, but just clarification about the uh, characteristics of an emergency use authorization and the other guidelines. Uh, so please raise your hand. I may be having some technical difficulties. So Mike, you may yep, need I to uh, rec no recognize problem. the person. Go ahead. No problem. All right, the first one we have is uh, Dr. Sawyer. Would you go ahead and turn your camera on? Thanks very much, Dr. Fink. You mentioned that issues related to manufacturing can be one of the reasons to revise or revoke an EUA. What is the monitoring process going forward from this point with regard to manufacturing process? Uh, thank you. So FDA continues to engage with the vaccine manufacturer uh, concerning manufacturing quality and control uh, issues to ensure that, that these remain adequate to support use of the vaccine under EUA. Um, I'll invite any of my other FDA colleagues to comment further. Yeah, um, this is Marion. Uh, can can you hear me, um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, no, I just wanted to second what, what Doran just um, uh, said. It, it is true that the monitoring of the CMC, that is the chemistry manufacturing and control information, that uh, is currently available and will, um, and, and we of course will get uh, additional data from the manufacturing, um, different, from the different manufacturing sites. Um, we will review this information and we will work together with the uh, vaccine manufacturer to make sure that the product that is made and generated um, is of adequate consistency and quality. So this is work that's going to be ongoing over the next um, month. Thanks very much. Okay, Arnold, are you able to see the? Uh, yep, Arnold, are you? No, able to I can on that that side of my screen. I see, but no, there's no act activity there. <laughs> okay, that's all right. So. Um, well, so you, you, please, you uh, why don't you manage the uh, yep. calling on? We'll take care of that. Right. All right, uh, Dr. Corella. Thank you. Um, I don't know why my camera is not working, but it says it's on. Uh, Doran, uh, just trying to understand the, the, 
the question we're being asked to vote on is uh, what Pfizer has requested. But if I understood your talk correctly, the um, uh, the the FDA can can limit the the actual uh, can place limits on the target populations or the specific. Uh, uh, in indications regarding regarding the EUA. My question is, what? How do you view the investigational status of the product under under an EUA? Thank you for the question. So, a product that is made available under an EUA is is an unapproved product. It has not been FDA licensed. So, so let me just can, if I can just follow up with that. So, if, if if you limited the EUA to a specific set of populations, um, even those populations that have the EUA, uh, uh, placebo-controlled trials would still be possible. From well, we will we we will have a discussion on those considerations uh, later this morning. But in FDA's view. Issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine should not preclude the conduct of placebo-controlled trials. In particular, in situations where that vaccine made available under an EUA is available only in limited quantity. Okay, I think uh, I can see now. Thank you for fixing it. Uh, Dr. Lee. So thank you. Um, one of the questions I have is a little bit more general. Uh, I recognize we're considering the Pfizer product for an EUA today. However, um, future uh, EUA applications, if, for example, there is a vaccine that is improved, approved under a BLA, vaccine number one, let's just call it that, will that make it more challenging for future products to request an EUA? Right. So I think what you're, you're getting at is the fourth uh, criterion for issuance of an EUA, which says that there uh, must not be any adequate, approved, and available alternative uh, therapy. Yeah, uh, correct. So first of all, if, if a vaccine is made available under an EUA, it is not approved. And right. so therefore, that would not preclude issuance of an EUA for another vaccine. If a vaccine is approved by FDA, that would also not necessarily preclude issuance of an EUA for another investigational COVID-19 vaccine. For example, if the approved vaccine is available only in limited quantity, then it may not be considered adequate to address the public health emergency. Uh, second of all, if the vaccine that is approved is approved for use only in a limited population, then that vaccine may not be considered adequate to address uh, the needs of the public health emergency for other populations. Thank you. Mr. Tubman. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you and the other members of the wonderful job at the whole country OCA at control. Do you speak a little louder, please? We're having problems yeah. hearing. Just, sorry. Just making a uh, Dr. Fick and everybody at the FDA for all the work that right. <laughs> independently reviewing the data. Thank you. Um, two questions. One is, you indicated that since uh, the commission came in from Pfizer, you've had a lot of ongoing discussions. And uh, the question, first question is, does, the, uh, does that include getting updated data? Because the close of the closing date, the data that's in their submission, is November 14th, which is 26 days ago, which is almost a month, about half of the entire period for the two months uh, minimum required for EUA. So have you gotten more recent requested and gotten more recent data? And the second question is a follow-up to 
Dr. Perla. Um, the question, you've given us only one question, and that is yes or no to recommending approval for the entire amount, which is uh, population which Pfizer is requesting, which is you know the entire 60 and over. But um, certainly the committee could view this as something they'd like to grant EUA for, but given the balancing of risk and benefit, it may be different for different populations, so we might want to grant it or recommend it be approved for a smaller set than Pfizer is asking for. But your question doesn't seem to allow for that. And I was wondering if you have a backup question that might be used. I know that in the, in the past with the Dengue review, uh -huh. there, there's backup questions, so just want to ask if you can answer those. Okay, uh, c could I could I uh, say that the set, your last question we can bring that up during the discussion later on. Uh, so uh, I'm going to excuse Dr. Fink from having to answer that part of the question. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, uh, to answer your your first question, uh, no, uh, we have not received additional data sets. Uh, beyond the data sets that were submitted to us uh, compromise, or com uh, comprising a, a cutoff date of November 14th. Um, as you can imagine, there is a tremendous amount of work uh, that goes into preparing a data set uh, for submission, uh, and so it, it really is infeasible uh, for the sponsor and, and for, for FDA uh, to be chasing our tails uh, uh, trying to get uh, data sets that encompass uh, more and more data as time goes on. Uh, that being said, um, if the sponsor becomes aware of or if we become aware of any data um, that uh, would potentially impact our benefit risk assessment, uh, we do have discussions with the sponsor regarding those data. And uh, we will be uh, able Mr. Taubman, to ask questions of the sponsor uh, after their presentation later on. So we can revisit this issue. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Pearl. So I just had a question about the last part of what you were talking about. When you talked about how Pfizer is going to deal with the issue of placebos going off the a vaccine trial, and you, you asked for advice from the committee. Is that part of the EUA vote, or is that a second issue? So that is not a, a question for a vote. It's just a, a, a an item for discussion. We'd like to uh, hear the committee's thoughts on the plan that is being proposed by Pfizer, which you will hear about in, in greater detail uh, later today. Dr. McGinnis. Um, I have a question that's sort of a follow-up from what Mike Carrilla originally started. Given that this is considered an investigational product under an EUA, I'm assuming that any manufacturer cannot actually market such an investigational vaccine. Is that correct? So this is a vac the emergency use authorization does not allow for commercial uh, distribution uh, of the vaccine via the usual uh, marketing that that would uh, be available to a licensed vaccine. Uh, so I, I hope that that clarifies things. Uh, if anyone else from from FDA wants to chime in, uh, I'd welcome uh, additional remarks. So so Doran, thank you. I just um, I'm happy to get the comments. I'm just trying to understand. So it's not marketed traditionally. But compensation for an investigational vaccine is possible under an EUA, like with a government entity? So again, this is not, not my area of, of expertise. Uh, I understand. The emergency use authorization may include uh, 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 conditions related to advertising uh, and, and other similar uh, issues in terms of uh, uh, transfer of, uh, of money between uh, vaccine recipients and providers or between uh, the U.S. government and, and the manufacturer, uh, I, I can't speak to those. Thank Dr. You. Meisner.
thank you, Dr. Monto. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Marks, and Dr. Fink, and Dr. Gerber for, and everyone else at, at the FDA, because the amount of work that you have done uh, is just extraordinary. And the briefing packets that have uh, been circulated are clear and extremely helpful. So thank you very much for your ongoing work. The question I have for you is, it will be advantageous for a number of reasons to have one of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, available under a biologic license application instead of an EUA. And can, can you, and I realize it's a difficult question, but can you offer any comments about uh, the route or the pathway forward uh, for the FDA to begin to think about when you've reached a point that you would consider a BLA? Yes. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, we do want any vaccine that is made available under an EUA uh, to uh, continue its testing to uh, allow for its licensure as soon as possible. Um, after issuance of the EUA. Uh, so this continued evaluation, uh, as I explained in my presentation, um, I think first and foremost would include uh, some longer-term follow-up of, uh, of, of participants in, enrolled in ongoing studies, um, as well as safety and effectiveness data coming out of use of the vaccine under the EUA. Uh, this additional evaluation uh, would then meet our usual expectations uh, for clinical data to be included in a licensure application. Uh, there are some other sources of, of information that involve uh, manufacturing and facilities uh, and uh, potentially uh, non-clinical studies as well uh, that we would typically require to support a licensure application uh, but are not absolutely necessary to support uh, issuance of an EUA. Is it possible to predict or estimate when conditions of safety and efficacy m might be satisfied for, BL for BLA? Uh, in terms of uh, the time it would take, yeah, I, I, I couldn't predict, but uh, I, I will say that uh, we, we typically ask for uh, at least six months of follow-up in uh, a substantial number of, of clinical trial participants uh, to constitute a safety database that would support licensure. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Fuller. Overview. My question: Did I understand you to say that the FDA, on, in the October 22nd meeting, looked at the manufacturing quality of the Pfizer vaccine, and that was satisfactory? And if so, how will that be evaluated in the actual distribution um, of the vaccine? And will we talk about that later? Right. So to to clarify what I said earlier, uh, as as part of the in, uh, EUA submission um, and uh, in information submitted uh, prior to the EUA, uh, FDA has been conducting an ongoing review of manufacturing quality, consistency, and, and control. And we have found this information to be adequate to support uh, emergency use authorization of, of the vaccine. Um, we are not intending to uh, discuss details of the manufacturing process, many of which are proprietary um, during today's meeting. Uh, but as Dr. Gruber and I discussed in response to a previous question, our review of the manufacturing uh, information is an ongoing process and will uh, continue uh, even after uh, the vaccine is authorized if, if that is the decision that we make. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Uh, 
you kicked us off with uh, a lot of information which we're going to be coming back to uh, later on this afternoon. I'd like next to call on Dr. Aaron Hall uh, from CDC, who's the co-lead in, in the Epidemiology Task Force, uh, and he is going to give us an update about the current situation. All right, thank you very much. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, so, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Aaron Hall, co-lead of the Epidemiology Task Force and CDC's COVID-19 response and chief of the Respiratory Viruses Branch. Uh, to help frame subsequent discussions today about COVID-19 vaccines, I would like to provide a brief update on the current epidemiology of COVID-19 in the United States. As of December 8th, over 14.8 million COVID-19 cases and over 280,000 associated deaths have been reported in the United States. The initial peak in early April was driven largely by elevated activity in the New York metro area, followed by a second larger peak in late July, primarily due to increased activity across much of the southern U.S. Since mid-September, daily counts of new cases have again been on the rise with even sharper increases since mid-October. Since submission of these slides in advance of this meeting, we have now surpassed 15 million cases and 285,000 deaths nationally, with over 200,000 new cases and over 2,500 new deaths reported yesterday. In addition to reported cases, CDC uses several other systems uh, to track the pandemic, which are compiled in the weekly surveillance summary called COVID View. This weekly report includes the percent positivity of molecular tests for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, shown in blue, as well as syndromic surveillance for COVID-19-like illness, or CLI, among ambulatory patients, shown in red. Both of these leading indicators have been increasing since September. Also included in COVID view are weekly hospitalization rates shown in gray, which are currently at the highest point since the beginning of the pandemic. And also the percent of deaths due to COVID-19, influenza or pneumonia based on death certificates shown in green, both of which are lagging indicators that have been increasing since October. One component of the weekly COVID view report is an assessment of COVID-19 hospitalizations through COVID-NET. COVID-NET conducts hospitalization surveillance in 14 states, representing about 10% of the U.S. population. Patients must be a resident of the surveillance area and have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test within 14 days prior to or during hospitalization. Medical chart reviews are conducted by trained surveillance officers and data are updated weekly on an interactive website. While focused on the more severe end of the illness spectrum, COVID-NET provides active population-based surveillance, thus overcoming some of the biases with passive surveillance and providing robust data on the epidemiology of COVID-19. Looking at weekly hospitalization rates by age, we see that each of the peaks in April, late July, and currently have been most pronounced among adults aged 65 years and older. Hospitalization rates in children have been considerably lower than those among adults, but have remained stable or increasing since the spring. Note that the last few data points are subject to reporting lag and may increase subsequently. Looking at the cumulative hospitalization rates through late November from COVID-NET and stratifying by age group, we see a strong increasing trend with increasing age. As of November 28th, adults aged 65 years and older had a cumulative rate of 756 per 100,000, which is roughly equivalent to one in every 130 people in this age group being hospitalized with COVID-19. This rate is approximately four and a half times greater than that of adults aged 18 to 49. 
COVID net surveillance has also helped to identify significant racial and ethnic disparities in the rates of COVID-19. Shown here are age-adjusted cumulative hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity, demonstrating rates are three to four times greater among persons that are Hispanic or Latino, non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native, or non-Hispanic Black or African American, compared with those that are non-Hispanic white. These disparities are likely multifactorial, potentially influenced by differential exposure rates, prevalence of underlying medical conditions, access to care, and other socioeconomic factors. To help further tease apart these issues and identify risk factors for severe COVID-19, CDC and public health partners analyzed the relative rates of in-hospital mortality from COVID-Net using models that adjust for age, sex, race and ethnicity, smoking, and several underlying medical conditions. As shown in the red box, older age was the strongest independent risk factor for in-hospital death, and the risk increased with increasing age. Other characteristics significantly associated with in-hospital mortality include male sex, immunosuppression, renal disease, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, neurologic disorder, and diabetes. Combining data from COVID-Net with population-based data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFSS, we likewise developed models to assess risk for COVID-19 hospitalization among adults with specific underlying conditions. Again, after adjusting for age, sex, and race and ethnicity, the risk for COVID-19-associated hospitalization was greatest for adults with severe obesity, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes, as shown in the red box. Compared with adults without these conditions, those that have them were three to five times more likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19. Furthermore, the risk of COVID-19 hospitalization increased with the number of underlying medical conditions as shown in the red box on this table. While specific risks vary depending on the specific underlying medical condition, adults with three or more conditions had five times the risk of COVID-19 hospitalization compared to adults with no conditions. Due to increased age, underlying medical conditions, and their congregant living situation, residents of long-term care facilities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. As shown here, residents of these facilities comprise nearly 50% of COVID-19 hospitalizations among adults aged 75 to 84 years, and nearly two-thirds of COVID-19 hospitalizations among adults aged 85 years and older. As such, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, or ACIP, recently recommended long-term care facility residents as a priority group to receive initial doses of COVID-19 vaccines once approved. Similarly, healthcare personnel have been prioritized for vaccination to preserve capacity to care for patients with COVID-19 and other illnesses. Again, based on COVID-Net data, 6% of adults hospitalized with COVID-19 were healthcare personnel, with nursing-related occupations being most frequent. Healthcare personnel hospitalized with COVID-19 had similar prevalence of underlying medical conditions, most notably obesity, as that observed among adults hospitalized with COVID-19, all adults. Likewise, a similar proportion of severe clinical outcomes, including ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death, occurred among healthcare personnel as that across all adult COVID-19 hospitalizations. As we prepare for COVID-19 vaccines, it's important to establish baselines to assess their future impact and maintain ongoing assessment of the total burden of SARS-CoV-2 infections in the U.S. To that end, CDC has implemented a nationwide seroprevalence survey to help track the number of people with evidence of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, including milder infections that do not result in care-seeking or testing for acute infection. 
These involve biweekly testing of approximately 50,000 residual specimens from commercial laboratories for antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Through the first few rounds of this survey, estimated seroprevalence has ranged from 0.4 to 23% across U.S. jurisdictions. However, as of late September, less than 10% of specimens from most jurisdictions had evidence of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection. In general, the highest seroprevalence was observed among children and adults aged less than 50 years, and lowest among older adults aged 65 and older. Using a different multiplier modeling approach, which uses reported cases and other data sources to then account for underdetection and underreporting, CDC recently released estimates of the total number of hospitalizations, illnesses, and infections with SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S. This analysis estimated that one of every 2.5 hospitalized cases and one of every 7.1 non-hospitalized cases may have been nationally reported. Applying these multipliers to reported cases through the end of September yielded a national estimate of 2.4 million hospitalizations, 44.8 million illnesses, and 52.9 million total infections. As the figure to the right shows, most estimated hospitalizations occurred among older adults, while most illnesses and infections were among younger adults. So in summary, now as of December 9th, over 15 million cases and over 285,000 deaths associated with COVID-19 have been reported in the United States. However, based on seroprevalence surveys and models, the total estimated number of infections is likely two to seven times greater than reported cases. Though less than 10% of the population in most states had evidence of previous infection through September. Factors associated with increased risk for severe COVID-19 include older age, racial and ethnic minority group membership, and several specific underlying medical conditions. Ongoing surveillance and epidemiologic studies will help inform further developments and implementation of candidate vaccines, including assessment of their impacts, safety, and effectiveness. Lastly, even with the promising advent of COVID-19 vaccines, there's continued need for non-pharmaceutical interventions, including mask use, physical distancing, hand hygiene, and environmental disinfection to help bring an end to this devastating pandemic. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the thousands of public health professionals that have worked tirelessly over the last 11 months on the CDC COVID-19 response, including the dedicated staff from the Respiratory Viruses Branch. Thank you. Uh, uh, COVID, uh, I think I wasn't, I wasn't on at first. Uh, thank you so much for being clear about the differential impact of uh, COVID-19 in the U.S. population. Uh, we have time for uh, relatively few questions. I see uh, Dr. Meisner, you have your hand raised. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Hong. I would like to ask you um, about uh, the severity of disease, <clears throat> particularly in older adolescents, that is, individuals who are 16 and 17 years of age, because they have been included in uh, the, re the company's request for an EUA. Um, I assume, I know, I, I assume it's unlikely that, that uh, hospitalizations and disease are broken down by age, but is it safe to assume that uh, uh, adolescents who are 16 and 17 years of age are similar uh, in the 5 uh, through 17-year-old age group? Yeah, thank you for that question. 
Um, so, of course, as we refine to smaller and smaller age brackets, the, the numbers get smaller, particularly in children where overall we see lower rates, particularly of severe disease, of hospitalization. Um, in general, we do see higher rates of hospitalization among children aged 0 to 5 relative to those aged 5 to 17. Of course, this is potentially uh, confounded by differential rates of care seeking. As you might imagine, there are certainly lower thresholds for care seeking for the very youngest and most vulnerable children. Um, however, as we start to look at the more mild end of the illness spectrum um, and look at rates of detection of SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, using molecular assays, we do see indication of, of higher rates of infection um, among older uh, children, among adolescents, uh, particularly then as we move into kind of older teenagers and uh, people in their young 20s. Um, much of this may have been driven um, in part by uh, outbreaks in the fall among institutes of higher education. Um, but the, the broader impacts uh, in children um, perhaps are not entirely clear until uh, the full resumption of normal activities um, ensues in the United States, including in-person education um, across uh, all schools in the United States. So we'll continue to monitor closely, but thus far the indication is um, the highest rates of illness, severe illness uh, in young children, but higher rates of infection um, in older children. Thank you. Dr. Rubin. Thanks, Dr. Hall. Um, I was interested in the um, in the multiplier um, that you described. That applies to uh, the diagnosis of infection. Do you think that applies to deaths as well? Yeah. So we have used at CDC uh, the same multiplier model previously for tracking influenza um, and generating uh, in-season estimates of the disease burden. And that same approach has been used previously to estimate deaths in the same manner that I presented today for hospitalizations and milder illness. Um, there are, of course, uh, differential multipliers that would have to be considered for deaths as the rates of underreporting of death um, are different than those for milder infection. In general, we have better capture of, of deaths. We have lower rates of underreporting and underascertainment for deaths. But as Folks are aware uh, the dynamics of the pandemic itself um, have greatly changed those multipliers. And so there's also a considerable time component that needs to be factored in um, when using these multiplier models. So the underreporting of deaths, for example, has changed over time. And the attribution of deaths to COVID-19 has changed over time, which complicates interpretation. Um, but we do have several efforts underway um, using these models and other approaches to generate estimates of death. And we do feel, as with hospitalizations and illnesses, that the reported number of deaths is likely an underestimate of the true number of deaths. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gans, we're going to go over a little bit. But please keep your questions short. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that, and I agree, heroic effort um, to all of the people who are working on this. I had two quick questions. Um, the data um, concerning the immunocompromised or immunosuppressed individuals is not really granular enough to make it um, something that we can use in terms of how we're thinking about um, high-risk populations. Um, there are registries looking at this, but it would be nice if there were some national in information that you could um, provide to us, as well as I didn't see any information from pregnant women, which is um, a population which we're all concerned about, and we've definitely seen postnatal transmission to very young infants who end up being hospitalized, if you would just um, take those up. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Uh, absolutely. Um, there are numerous surveillance efforts currently underway to assess the impacts of COVID-19 in pregnant women. Uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, today, I didn't have a chance to present those. But um, through COVIDnet, as described today, as well as um, another surveillance system called SETnet, which was established uh, during the Zika epidemic, 
Um, we have been very closely monitoring the impacts of COVID-19 in both pregnant women and subsequently following up with their infants. Um, thankfully, the rates overall have been relatively low thus far, um, but as we continue to accumulate a critical mass of data in this demographic, um, we indeed do hope to have um, more specific estimates of the risks that are posed to pregnant women and their infants. The early indication is that there may be um, a risk, higher risk, of preterm delivery uh, among pregnant women infected with COVID-19 relative to uh, women without COVID-19. Um, but there's ongoing efforts to assess those and other potential pregnancy-related risks and fetal outcomes. Thank you very much, Dr. Hall. And uh, it's now time for our morning break. Uh, we've eaten into the uh, time a little bit, but I do want to start again at 1030 Eastern uh, so uh, we can hear from Dr. Messonnier uh, from CDC. See you later. <laughs>